I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Kevin's a ton of fun, super smart, very strategic, and a great preacher. So it's great to have Kevin with us this morning. Would you welcome him this morning? Well, thank you, New Life, for being here. If John is, Josh is in charge of your numbers, you need to pray harder and give more. Amen? <laughs> um, it is great to be here. It's great that um, New Life and Canvas Church can be partners in advancing the mission of Jesus um, together. We steal a lot of ideas that you guys do. In fact, that's why I went with West to Africa earlier this year in January, and um, one of the influences that your church is having on our church is next year in January, we're launching and becoming a, a compassion church, and, and our church is gonna be adopting a bunch of compassion kids in a, a compassion area, and that's um, your influence on us. So I, I thank you for that, and it's, it's gonna be fun to see what happens here. I, I love this area. Um, I, I grew up in Montana, eastern Montana, but my senior year, I moved to Shelton, Washington, and so I graduated as a high climber. Any high climbers here? Yeah, yeah, if I was a high climber, I wouldn't raise my hand. Okay, one of you, awesome there. Um, very good. I, I graduated my, my senior year there and, um, and then um, did a ministry in White Center area in Seattle for a while, and then God called me back to the zip code of heaven, which is 59991 Kalispell, and we've been loving it there and seeing a Jesus movement happen there. Um, we are in week six of a series that you've been talking about called a uh, moonshot. Um, th this, this clear, uh, bold, and audacious, impossible dream that God places upon your heart and your own expression of what God wants to do with your life. And, and you've been looking at a lot of ways of what it means and how do I live that out. And today we're going to bring that series to a close. And, and we're going to look at what happens when I begin to do my moonshot and I hit a roadblock. Because sometimes we, we, we step out and we think it's going to happen overnight. Like, God gave me this vision. I'm ready to do this. Let's get it done tomorrow. And it doesn't always happen that way. And sometimes we run into roadblocks that sometimes God places there. And sometimes we place them there ourselves. And how do we react when that takes place? So you've been in Acts chapter 6, um, Acts, the whole book of Acts, because the whole book of Acts is a God moonshot. Um, but we're going to be in Acts 16, because in Acts 16, something um, really happens when, that helps us deal with roadblocks. Um, Paul and Silas, they were excited. God had given them the moonshot to go and take the gospel of Jesus to places where it's never been before. And they're like, come on, let's go to Asia. In Acts chapter 16, verse 6, on their way to Asia, they hit a roadblock. In fact, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit prevented them from going to Asia. And so they're like, okay, we're not going to Asia. And we don't know how the Holy Spirit did that, if, if there were circumstances that rose or if the Holy Spirit nudged or pinged their hearts or not to. We don't, the Bible doesn't tell us that. We just know that they were prevented from going there. So then they go, let's go to Bithynia. That, that's in verse 7. Let's go to Bithynia. And they're on their way there. And then the verse says, and the Holy Spirit prevented them from going there. Now, if you're Paul and Silas and you're like, I got this moonshot in my heart. We're going to take the gospel of Jesus everywhere. And you begin to go and you hit a wall and then you get it this way and you, you hit a wall and it's God putting these walls in your, in your way. You're going to be like, what? Oh, this is so frustrating. You might just want to give up on the moonshot. But, but here's, here's what Jesus comes and does here in verse 9. It'll be on the screen. It says this. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him. This is happening in a dream. Come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave Macedonia at once, having concluded that, and here's where I want you to see these words right here. Having concluded that, get this right here. Sometimes God gives you a moonshot, but he doesn't give you all the details on how to get it accomplished. Because part of the greatest part of a moonshot is not getting it done, but going on the journey to accomplish what God has called you to do. Here's Paul and Silas go, let's go. Oh, we can't go this way. Oh, we can't go this way. They're still figuring out. They just know where they needed to go. As we chase our moonshots, there's always going to be detours. There's always going to be challenges. There's always going to be roadblocks that come up. 
Paul's moonshot didn't change. He didn't change. Just where he was going changed. His moonshot was take the gospel of Jesus to people who have never heard it before. See, Paul's moonshot was not about what he wanted to do. It was about being obedient to what God called him to do. Joshua's moonshot you read about in Joshua chapter 6. Joshua is one of my favorite guys in the Old Testament, and God gave him a moonshot. Here's what his moonshot was. You're going to take the people of Israel, big nation, and you're going to take them into the promised land. And to get to the promised land, you have to go through the city of Jericho. The thing about Jericho was there was a wall all the way around the wall, huge wall, that was preventing the Israelites from getting into the promised land. Talk about a roadblock. There's a roadblock right there. And Joshua's job is to take people, take the nation of Israel into the promised land. And here, that's a very clear, bold, and audacious, and impossible moonshot. Joshua, you're going to take them here. They've tried this before, and it didn't work for them. Israel's been here before, and then they, then they ran off. We'll hit that in a second. But here was a roadblock that was stopping Joshua from accomplishing exactly what God was wanting him to do. And as I was looking at this text and I was thinking about it, I thought, what are the roadblocks that often can come up into our life that stop us from living out the passion, the dream, the vision, the moonshot God's placed on each one of our lives? In fact, here's what's going to happen. Some of you are thinking about your moonshot right now. Some of you are like, I don't even, I don't even know what my moonshot is. God's going to give it to you throughout this message today. Because here's how I prayed for this gathering. Not that you would just hear, and not that you would just respond in your heart. My dream and the way we prayed this morning for this gathering is that God would touch your feet, that you would go live out this dream that God's going to place on your heart. This is a call to action. If you're going to end a moonshot series, it can't be theoretical. It has to be applicable. Something that we can go and do. This is our moment. So what are the roadblocks that can often stop us from living out and being what God wants us to be. Well, I think the first one that could be a roadblock for us is maybe we don't like God's plan that he's given to us. Think of your Joshua. You know what Joshua's plan was to get through Jericho that God gave him? Here's what it is. It's, it's just crazy. He goes, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go, and on day one, you're going to march around the wall, and you're going to do that for six days. Then on the seventh day, you're going to march around it seven times. Then you're going to blow a trumpet. Then you're going to yell, ha, ah! and then the wall's going to come down. That's the stupidest plan I've ever read. <laughs> How would you respond if God gave you that moonshot? Like if I'm Joshua, I'm like, I'm not coming out of the tent. You know, that's, that's a crazy idea. Sometimes God may have given you a moonshot and you don't like it. Maybe God's calling you to be a Bronco fan. Yeah, no way. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry, God would never do that. He loves us. <laughs> Come on. Sometimes we don't like God's plan. Another roadblock that could be in our life that stops us from living out our moonshot is fear. Fear is a powerful force. Fear can stop us from going where God wants us to go. <coughs> Excuse me. Think about the, the, the Israelites had been to the promised land on the edges of it before. You can read about it if you want to know more in Numbers chapter 14. They had gotten there. They got so afraid of what was in the promised land that they ran away. That's why they spent 40 years in the wilderness. And now a whole new nation, a whole new generation had come up, and Joshua um, is, is leading them. He was one of the two that was there uh, in, in the Numbers 14 story. And he has to take this generation into the promised land. And I'll bet you there was fear in, in his heart. And here's, here's what's amazing about fear. Fear, honestly, we can have a dysfunctional past and we're more comfortable with our dysfunctional past than we are with an unknown future. And we'll return to a dysfunctional past. That's what the Israelites wanted to do. When they got to the promised land, here's what they were saying. Let's go back to Egypt. Because there we were whipped and slaves and our children were thrown in the river. Let's go there, then go into an unknown future. It's amazing how fear can stop us from going where God wants us to go. Fear has a way of doing that. Maybe your moonshot that God's placed on your life, what's stopping you from moving and accomplishing it is fear. Fear of the unknown. In fact, I'll even say maybe, maybe your moonshot, because this is the greatest moonshot there is, Maybe your moonshot is becoming a person that says yes to Jesus. 
And maybe you've been coming here, but you haven't made that, that decision yet because you know what your life is like without Jesus. It's the unknown of what does it mean to say yes to Jesus. And that unknown is stopping you from, from marking that box on the connection card and praying a, a prayer in your heart to say yes to Jesus. And, and I'm going to really encourage you to don't let fear stop you from making the best decision of your life ever. I think another thing that can stop us from moving and accomplishing what God wants us to do is sin. And why sin? You know, unforgiveness or bitterness or whatever sin that you hold on to. Sin's interesting because it blinds us from seeing. It blinds us from seeing open doors that God opens for us so that we could accomplish the moonshot that he's, comp he's calling us to do. But, but sin blinds us from seeing it. Sin blinds us from seeing people who come into our life that's going to help walk us and help us accomplish that moonshot, help us accomplish that vision or passion that, that God has for us. But when, when we allow sin to fester in our life, and we're aware of it, but we're not confessing it and giving it over to him, it becomes scales on our eyes that stop us from seeing what God is wanting to do in our lives. So we have to confess that sin. Sometimes finances can be a roadblock. When we manage it how we want to instead of how God desires, that becomes a roadblock because God's not blessing us in the way that he wants to. And we're always going to be hitting a wall, hitting a wall, hitting a wall. And then sometimes, I think maybe even... Even equal to fear, thank you, even, even to fear is reputation. I think reputation can stop us from going where God wants us to go. I'm going to go back to the story of Joshua. Joshua, inside his tent. Think about it. I have to go out there. He had just become the leader. This is his first big thing. I, I have to come out and tell everybody the plan of marching around the wall 13 times. I don't want to go out there. What are they going to think of me? In fact, let's put ourselves in the Bible. What would you do if Pastor Wes Davis came up here, and, and, and Wes is a dreamer. He could do this. <laughs> if Wes came out here and said, hey, buddy, here's what we're going to do. Every day this week, we're going to march around this wall or this, this building one time. Next Sunday, we're going to march around it seven times. We're going to blow trumpets. Anybody play the trumpet here? Because we're going to need to recruit you. Okay, great. You're in. You're in. You're on my team. We're going to yell at the church building. Ah! And it's going to be twice its size. <laughs> How many of you would show up tomorrow and march around the building once? Yeah. Well, you know what most of us are going to be thinking? Pastor West needs counseling. <laughs> and a lot more. Like he's lost it. Sometimes God gives us a moonshot in our hearts that's bold and audacious, but clear, but seems impossible, and we're afraid we might fail. Or what would people think about us even if I shared this to somebody? And it becomes a roadblock that stops us. Yet the alternative, the alternative of not following what God wants you to do in your life is to live in defeat, and no one wants to live in defeat. I came home from work several years ago, and I walked into the, into the kitchen, and we have sliding glass doors right there in the kitchen. And, um, and I looked outside, and I saw a, a bowl of cat food out on the deck. And, and I got to just tell you, real frank, I don't like pets. I don't want pets. Um, I, and I'm not a pet fan. Um, but in our house, we have a dog, and we have a cat, and we have a bird. And so you know who, you, you know who runs our house. I also have five children. And um, so I have a ton of pets. And, um, and, and I don't like outdoor pets. We, most of, in fact, all of them but one kid live inside. And um, <laughs> no, they all live inside. Um, um, but um, I don't like outdoor pets, so I like indoor pets. And, and, and so there would be no way we would have food outside on that deck. And there is that bowl of food outside on that deck. And, and I go, Tiffany, that's my wife. Um, so I said that in a very loving tone. That didn't come across very loving in that way. I just said it there. I, I said, Tiffany. Um, and, and love. And she said, what? And I go, what, what, what? Why is there cat food outside? <laughs> I'm not sounding very loving, but this is not how this, honey, honey, sweetie, why is there cat food outside? Like, what's going on? She's like, oh, Kevin, I, I saw this cat, and it was so skinny. Don't, 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 don't do the cry thing, okay? 
She goes, it was so skinny, it, it, it needed food, so I fed it. You never feed an outside cat that's astray because they totally skipped the adoption process and there's no paperwork and they own you. You never own a cat, they own you. So now every day, and, and here's the reason why I don't like cats specifically. Because the next day I come home and I'm out on the deck and this cat is walking up the stairs to the deck and it looked at me. And I looked at that cat. And that cat tilted its head to the side and Hallmark music began to play in the background. <laughs> and I don't care how much of a dog person you are, sometimes a cat can just get in your heart. <laughs> oh man, that's just gross. Sorry, that was a fur bomb. Um. <laughs> the other gatherings don't get that. And, and so I'm coming home from work now, and I'm going, has anybody fed the outdoor cat? We named it Outdoor Cat. And um, I go, has anybody fed the outdoor cat? Are we taking care of the outdoor cat? Well, I, I came home. Now, some of you are going, is this message going anywhere? They told me to finish uh, Phil 30 minutes, so that's just what I'm doing. Um, <clears throat> I, I come from home, home from work, and I noticed that the garage door hadn't been shut all the way, so we had a family meeting, and we talked about how important it is to close the garage door because raccoons will get in, and, and we got be, to be wise in doing that. Well, that night around 7 o'clock, I hear a thud in the garage. And immediately I go, we got raccoons, okay? They're, they're in the garage. So I go downstairs, and I open up the door going into the garage, and I saw, <laughs> take off all these Little kittens. Aww. Oh, yeah, you're with me. <laughs> that cat was not thin. It had been pregnant and had just given birth. And we were so nice that it just moved his whole family into us. <laughs> and, and here's the truth, and I don't care how manly man, man, man you are. When you see five little kittens huddled together, it's going to melt your heart. <laughs> they were so cute. And I reached down to pick him up. I loved it. And have you ever heard of the word feral? <laughs> now, I'd never heard of the word feral. Let me describe to you what feral means. It's like a big cactus that's chasing you to hug you. That's the best definition. Okay? I reached down to love those little five kittens. Did you know that kittens spit? <laughs> didn't know that either. I wasn't homeschooled. I didn't learn all this stuff. Okay? <laughs> No other gathering is getting that joke either, okay? We're just gonna, I gotta be nicer. So I reached down to pick up the cats and they went, Shh. they hissed, so I knew they were demon possessed. And they went, ah, and they were like this and then they're spitting at me. Ah, ah, ah. I, I screamed like a junior high girl. I was just like, what is going on? And so we had to get them out of our garage because you know what little kittens do? They do two things, pee and poop and eat. That's three things, okay? <laughs> Told you I wasn't homeschooled. They, they, did, they did three things, uh, poop, pee, and, and eat, and they were making a mess in my garage, so we got this plan. We made a tunnel, not a tunnel, but like a walkway, a, a hallway with cardboard, and then this is about 7, 707 we started this on um, that evening, and Tiffany would get the kitties to run down this path that we had made so they couldn't go any other direction. And then you know when TVs used to come in a big box? You know, and um, we got this big box and I put it over to the side and then she would chase them and I would have my oven mitts on. These are, are my, my kitty carriers and they would come running down and I would pick them up because they had these claws and they were just going crazy. They were kicking and screaming. They were feral and I'd pick them up and I'd throw them really quick because I, I realized I had about two and a half seconds to get them off or their claws were going through the oven mitts. They would fly through the air. They would hit the wall and then fall into the box. Okay. That was the plan. From 7.07 until 12.18, we were down there trying to, the last one we named Lucifer, okay? <laughs> and, and we struggled with that one alone for about an hour. 
And finally, we got them into the box. Well, I, we can't leave them in the box. I put food on one side for them. I put kitty litter on the other side for them. And then I, I went back to my office, and um, I was telling my, my team about this. I go, I don't know what I'm going to do with these five kitties. we got to get rid of them. They're feral. I've never seen anything like this in my life. They're horrific. And my administrative assistant, who lives on a ranch and has a rat problem, says to me, I'll take all five. I'm like, that is phenomenal. <laughs> I was so excited, I left work early, because I always leave work early, and I went home, and I leaned over into the box where my kittens were at, and I said, guys, I have plans for you not to harm you, but to give you a future and a hope. You're going to a land flowing with milk and rats. You're going to love it. And I reach down there to get a little lick, and they go, ah, ah, ah. I had a plan for them. I had hope for them. And the reason this story is so important in this text right here, segue, is because the human heart is because the human heart is feral like a kitten. And our heavenly father leans over out of heaven and he says to each one of us, I have a plan for you. I have a moonshot for you. I have a vision for your life. And we can get so scared of the unknown, we want to stay in the box even though our food and our kitty litter are getting all mixed up. And we miss what God is trying to do because our hearts can so easily stay feral. That's what happens if Joshua doesn't come out of the tent. That's what ha happens if Paul and Silas, after trying to go to two different places to share the gospel, decide to give up and quit. They stay in the box. But God has a vision and a dream and a passion and a moonshot in your life that's beyond what you could ever imagine. So how do we remove these roadblocks in our life? Well, you got to hear Joshua chapter 6 verse 2 because it's critical to removing roadblocks. Here's what it says. This is a truth that motivates us to move. It says this, but the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho. I've given you its king and I've given you its strong warriors. And God told Joshua this even before he gave him the plan. And the reason he says is, all you have to do is follow me. The work has already been, get, been done. A God-given moonshot is never in doubt. The battle has already been won. He wouldn't give you a vision if he wasn't going to see it through. So how do we do our part? How do we remove the roadblocks? How, how do we keep in tune so we can know where God is leading us? Here's the two things. Two things. Two keys to navigating roadblocks in our life. Two things that get us, getting us out of the box and to the ranch. How do we do it? The first one is you have to trust Jesus. You have to trust him. You might not see all the plans. See the problem with the cats? They couldn't see the ranch. They didn't know how they were going to get there. They didn't know anything about it. And as much as I told them, and as much as I talked to them, and as much as I tried to get them to like me, they allowed fear to control them. You have to trust Jesus. You have to trust him when you cannot see the plan. Sometimes he'll give us the moonshot, the destination, but he doesn't give us the journey. And we have to trust him every step along the way. So when we don't see the whole plan, we have to trust. When our fear comes and grips us, we have to trust. When, when he brings a sin that we need to confess to him, we have to trust that he's going to work us through it. We have to trust. And then the second thing we have to do is we have to obey. Trust and then obey. You have to move. You will never accomplish your moonshot if you never take a step forward. So you can sit here and you can listen to this message and you can know what your moonshot is 
and it can stir and boil in your heart, and then you can go home and continue doing the same things you always do. But if you don't take a step in the direction of accomplishing your moonshot, it will never get closer to you. Where the analogy, because every analogy breaks down, where the analogy of the cats in the box breaks down is I forced those cats to go. I reached down with my oven mitts and I threw them in another cage. I made them go. Jesus will never reach down into your box and force you to go. You have to trust and reach out and grab him. Don't stay feral. Obey him, trust, and then take that step. Take that step where you reach out and grab his hand and you let him lead you along the way. And here's the thing we have to know. Sometimes we get a moonshot and we want it to happen overnight. But the reality of a moonshot is they often don't happen overnight. They take time. The wall of Jericho didn't come down on day one when they were marching around it. The wall of Jericho didn't come down on day two when they were marching around it. The wall of Jericho came down after seven days and 13 laps and a trumpet concert and a bunch of screaming. And then it came down. Sometimes our moonshots take time. And during that time, we have to keep trusting and we have to keep obeying. There was this time I was speaking at a kid's camp. You guys are just coming out of a kid's camp. I love kid's camp. I was speaking at a kid's camp, and um, I had done a story about Jericho and the walls, but I was talking a little differently about what are the walls in your life that are stopping you from where, going where God wants you to go. And I took two paper bags, and I stuck them together, and it made a brick. So I made a, a big brick wall for all the kids to see, and then I was marching around it and talking about it. And then I knocked down the, the wall when they weren't expecting it. It was awesome because they jumped and were scared and piddled, but it was really cool. And, um, and, and, and then I, I brought it back around, and I said, maybe God wants to knock down a wall in your life. If God wants to knock down a wall in your life, I want you to come down to the front here, and we're going to pray for you. And a, a little girl came down, and, and in fact, there was a lot of people down praying, but there's this one little girl that I remember, and I went over, and I said, hey, is, is God knocking down the wall in your life? And she goes, which is not what I was expecting. And I go, do you know what it is? And she goes, I go, do you want him to knock it down? Is he knocking it down? I'll be right back. I came back a little later, asked the same questions, and God wasn't knocking down that wall. Well, it just so happened that that night, her mom was in the crowd. And her mom came up to me, and I go, I know what my daughter is praying about and what wall she wants to come down. I go, what is it? What is it? Tell me. And she said, a year ago, she saw her two-year-old brother get run over by a car. And she's never mourned about it. She's never cried about it. And we've sort of lost our daughter. She's got all inside Mom is crying, I'm crying, and that girl's not. And I went up and I said to her, is, is your wall about your brother? You want that hurt and pain to go away? So I went over and I, I grabbed a brick. And I had her stand up and I gave her the brick. I said, this is your brick, this is your wall. I want you to take it home with you from camp. And I want you to put it, I want you to put it on your dresser. And then every time you see that brick on your dresser, I want you to remember God's already done the work of knocking it down. Just keep trusting him and obeying him. You just keep it up. So she got in her car with that brick and she went home. About a month and a half later, I don't know how the mama found my email, but I got an email from mom. And here's what it said. Last week, my little girl came down the stairs with that brick in her hand. And she said, Mommy, Jesus knocked down my wall. And with tears coming down her face, she crushed that little brick. New life. God places a moonshot in your heart because he loves you. He leans over heaven with great excitement as he speaks that moonshot into your life because he knows how good it will be for you. And then he says, trust me. 
and obey. So I wondered, how do you close this? How do you bring this to, a, to an end? How do you, how do you land a six-week series on, on moonshot? I thought you've got to give Jesus the last word. And the words of Joshua chapter 1 verse 9 came to me. They were the words that Jesus, because he was the commander of the Lord's army. It's a moment where Jesus shows up in the, in the Old Testament. And he spoke these words to Joshua right before he told Joshua about Jericho. And I say these words because they're as relevant back then as they are today. I say these words to you, new life, as they're the words of Jesus over your life because the promise is truth. And here's what he says, the words of Jesus. This is my command. Your moonshot is not an idea. Your moonshot is a command. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Come on, hear these as the words of Jesus over your life. Do not be discouraged for the Lord God is with you wherever you go. New Life, will you grab your connection card? We fill these out at Canvas too. And a statement that we make is that truth demands a response. It's the way a communicator feels. Because you will respond to this message even if you don't want to. You're going to respond in one of two ways. You're either going to allow God to move you on your journey of faith with him, or you will harden your heart to this truth as the Holy Spirit is speaking it to you. But you will respond. Truth demands it. And if you're here and you haven't, you haven't said yes to Jesus, and that's what you've been thinking about through this, I need to do this. I need to stop thinking about it. It's time to trust him and obey. I got to get out of my box. If that's you, will you mark that first box? I've said yes to Jesus. Pray it in your heart. Jesus, I say yes to you. And fill out that box and write your name on here because they're going to follow up with you. Maybe it's the second one here. I'm facing a roadblock. I'm trying. I keep hitting roadblocks. Pray that I'll stay close to Jesus. Pray that I'll keep my eyes focused on him. Pray that I'll just keep trusting him. Maybe it's the third one. I need some encouragement. This is taking me longer than I thought it was going to take. Will you send me some scriptures and make sure you have your email address on there and they're going to send you some encouraging scriptures to keep on keeping on. And if you're here and you're going, I don't even have a moonshot. I don't even know what to do. Well, do the fourth one. I know a high schooler who needs to be at summer camp. Send me a link to help register them. Just take a step. Take a step. Would you stand with me? Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us so much. And my simple prayer over new life today. May we be strong. May we be courageous. May our hearts go from feral to trusting and obeying. And may we do it with confidence because we know that you are with us and you will never leave us.